Welcome to the Open Door. Jim Hannick here with co-host Mario Ramos Reyes. Today, we're going to talk about racial reparations. Our special and returning guest is Daniel Philpot, professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame. He specializes in religion and global politics with a focus on reconciliation, the political behavior of religious actors, and Christian political theology. His books include Revolutions in Sovereignty from Princeton, Just and Unjust Peace, An Ethic of Political Reconciliation from Oxford, and Religious Freedom in Islam, The Fate of a Universal Human Right in the Muslim World, again from Oxford. Most recently, he has authored an essay titled A Christian Case for Racial Reparations. Let's begin in prayer. Come, O Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who has taught the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same Spirit we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let, let me begin with a metaphor. Is uh, racism in America both like and unlike original sin? Well, thank you. Thank, it's wonderful to be here and uh, have a chance to discuss these ideas. You know, we talk about justice in context, and um, we've seen in the last three years or so, well, we just had the anniversary of the um, killing of, of George Floyd, um, and a tremendous outbreak of protests, um, conversation, uh, urgent demands about racism in America's past. And whatever one thinks about exactly the reality of racism or what kind of measures should be taken against it, it seems to be still with us. I mean, this is not a kind of resolved issue. Uh, the fact that it is so hotly um, disputed and talked about. And um, if you look at the differences in polling data, um, certainly African-Americans um, overwhelmingly seem to think that there's still a problem. Um, there's a vast disparities between um, whites and, and blacks over this. But the fact that uh, there's a problem that persists that goes deep, deep in America's history is where the uh, analogy of uh, original sin comes to be. Obviously, in the in the Bible, um, in the Christian tradition, original sin is something ha that happens with the first humans and that every subsequent human, um, you know, participates in, um, you know, faces, uh, you know, the reality of original sin. So there is something metaphorical about it. But I think what it captures is the fact that this is something that is deep in American history. It goes back to um, colonial times, the earliest early 17th century, to the legacy of slavery, the legacy of Jim Crow, the legacy of what I call economic distributive injustice. And it's still with us. It's still something that persists. And it's something that continues to be very... Um, debilitating and, and divisive and eats away and continues to have wounds as sin does. Sin always is, is it's a wrong, but it also, it's a wrong that diminishes flourishing that leaves wounds. And so I think in all those ways, um, you know, just talking about it as a kind of individual isolated sin that doesn't do justice to it. Original sin captures something of that deep seated, historical, collectively shared, uh, ongoing wounds kind of phenomenon. Reaches deep. Yes. Yes. Mario? Well, um, 
It's very interesting. Um, but the question I think it is, um, if uh, we inherited the original sin, uh, we are talking about here a nation. Um, how is it a nation rather than an individual or person uh, need to apologize for a past wrong? Yeah, it's a very good question. And this has to do with in what ways the injustice continues to endure or to stand in our um, life today. Um, now, a couple of ways that people deal with this. One is they, you know, debate uh, about whether there is racism today. And there are strong studies that show that there is, but then others to say, well, there, there's really not. We've gotten past that. Others say, well, the fact that you and I are not racist or haven't committed invidious uh, discrimination, um, you know, means that we're not responsible for the things that have happened. But I think there is a responsibility. And what I would point to is um, the collective nature of the injustices. Um, now, many kinds of injustices have what could be called a collective and an individual face to them. Um, if one is uh, wounded or victimized by a state or a corporation or some kind of collective entity, there's really these two different faces. On one hand, there's the, say one is a victim of a war crime. There is the act that the person who committed the crime um, chose to commit as an individual. And that individual dimension dies with the person who did it. But there's also a collective dimension. If I was wounded by a person in um, wearing a uniform, then in effect, it was the state against whom I was wounded and was was uh, was injured. Um, somebody acting in the name of the state, in the name of the laws, um, either empowered by unjust laws or acting contrary to the just laws, but nevertheless was done to me as a collective. This intuition, by the way, is what is behind um, scores of different apologies that have taken place in the last couple of generations. The apologies uh, performed by uh, German heads of state with regard to the Nazis, which have become more common since, say, around 1970. Apologies, um, uh, Japan, uh, Australia, Canada, many other uh, examples. There were also the apologies in the Catholic Church committed, or sorry, voiced by Pope John Paul II. And he uh, voiced over 100 apologies with respect to 21 different historical episodes. All of those only made sense because the wrongs had a collective dimension. They were committed in the name of a collectivity. And as long as that collectivity lives on, the collective dimension of that wrong lives on. So in the United States, you had slavery that was um, legalized by the state. You had Jim Crow laws that were passed by the state. You also had deeply unjust actions such as lynching and so forth that were not enforced by the state. And then you have what is called economic distribution where the state was responsible for vastly dis discriminatory disbursement of um, vast amounts of funds that did a lot to create inequality. So these were wrongs that were in, perpetrated by the state in the name of the collective. And it is those wrongs that for which there can be reparations or apologies reciprocally voiced in the name of the head of state or the, the, the one who speaks authoritatively for the state. That's very helpful. Uh, Dan, let's, let's focus now on just what counts as reparations. What's your working definition of reparations? Here I look to the United Nations, which has set forth a reparations um, and a set of guidelines in 2004. And there are many different kinds of reparations. Um, one is uh, what might be called a, two categories, material reparations, where the state or the collectivity gives um, material transfers to victims uh, for, for crimes. But the other is an apology. Now, we may not instantly think of an apology as a reparation, 
Um, we use a different term for it, but in a, in a sense, an apology is reparative. It is meant to take responsibility for a past wrong, to atone for it, and it's in some way um, bring about remedy for it. All right, that gives us a focus. Mario? Well, uh, if that is the case, then I guess, perhaps, that the same reparation we may need with a dictatorship in a particular country, which in the name of the state, they violate or they justify certain actions which were against a human right. So the next generation, when the dictatorship is gone, then there is a reaction to that and there is a petition for reparation. Will that uh, assessment will be correct? Yes. And one, one of the interesting global trends in the past generation has been a whole wave of countries that have sought to leave behind uh, dictatorship or civil war and make a transition to democracy or a peace settlement. Uh, there have been you know, some 90 countries have made the transition towards democracy. A record-setting uh, set of countries has um, engaged in peace settlements um, since uh, 1989. And so there are new uh, practices that have emerged globally for trying to address these past injustices. And dictatorship is one of the major parts of it. And so different kinds of measures come to the fore. There's uh, the call for truth-telling. There's a call for apologies. There's a call for reparations. There's a call for punishing the perpetrators of uh, human rights uh, crimes. And um, so uh, reparations is, is one of the things that has increased uh, globally in recent years. Um, now, the, the, it, does, it does go back a little bit. I think that the largest reparations uh, settlement in history is... Um, uh, th that which uh, the Federal Republic of Germany paid uh, with respect to the Nazi crimes uh, to the nation of Israel, the 1952 Luxembourg Agreement. But in more recent years, we've seen Chile, Argentina, Canada, Australia, and other cases of countries engaging in um, reparations to victims for what they suffered uh, under a dictatorship. Yes. And how can we avoid that uh, action of reparation become um, instrument of certain ideologies because uh, along this line we can claim or some people are, are doing that that um, well the conquest and colonization of Spain was done um, violating some of the basic human rights and so then we can claim the reparation to the 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 kingdom of spain yes well a couple of criticisms uh, of reparations are first of all that um they can become politicized you know just instruments of one faction against another one party against another um and then also that um they become kind of endless that uh you know there are a lot, lot of injustices out there in the world and you know how far back do we go? Do we go back to the Garden of Eden? Does every country give reparations for every, uh, you know, wrong in its history? Um, well, the, these are both um, legitimate uh, uh, objections, but I think they can both be addressed. Um, an answer to politicization is something that, uh, well, it should be done even-handedly. It should be done for the largest crimes. It should be done for the large the crimes that most have ongoing wounds um it's true that not all of them can be um addressed but um if we look at wrongs human rights violations um on objective grounds um you know so, some are larger than others um and you know if there are obvious obvious selectivities then that has to be avoided but if you take a look at something like a country's treatment of its indigenous population, um, this is not politicized. This is you know objectively true that this happened, that it was largely this group against that group, and um, and so we can talk about reparations in a in a consensual way. That is also something very important. That the best apologies and reparations are ones that 
are negotiated, that are carefully crafted consensually, that a public case is made for them, um, that, uh, you know, they are rendered as something that we are doing as a society. And if you look at something like Australia's um, reparations for its treatment of Native peoples, um, this is, you know, the successful ones have those qualities. I had a, um, a dissertation student who wrote her dissertation on what makes for successful apologies. And those are some of the characteristics. There are other examples, say, for instance, Japan's um, in the 1990s and 2000s, which were largely politicized or, or seen as politicized. They were divisive. Um, this had to do with Japan's crimes against um, Chinese and other neighbors in World War II. And only in the 1990s did they decide to um, have apologies. But the apologies really didn't succeed. There was a kind of a nationalist backlash against them. No, no, we weren't the perpetrators. We were much more victims. And what about them? What, what don't they need to apologize? And so it had that kind of politicized character to it and really did not succeed in building yeah. consensus and reconciliation, but only in increasing division. Dan, just a, a little technical thing. I'm getting a slight echo uh, from you. Okay. Nothing significant, but I, I notice it. I, I don't know. Perhaps you're a little close to the mic. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. I'll try to sit back a little bit here. Yeah. Now, uh, two questions. When there is a discussion of, of uh, just war, and there are so many discussions of it, sometimes people will say, well, in a war, an entire population is responsible. And I always argue that, that that's not the case, that an entire population is responsible. Uh, for example, in, in many instances, uh, uh, indiscriminate weapons are used against entire populations, which include dissidents within that population that actively oppose particular war. Uh, so that would that would suggest that sometimes uh, an appeal to collective responsibility is far too sweeping. Now, shift that over to reparations. Uh, suppose there's a, a recognizable partisan group within a given, given country that uh, actively and at great risk, the members great risk to their own lives, uh, oppose the policy of their own country. The war comes to an end. Uh, the country had been involved in actions that, that need to be addressed. But why is it that people who actively oppose those policies should now be held responsible for the actions which at the time they at risk their lives opposed? Yeah, no, it's a good question. It gets back to the uh, collective versus individual nature of, of the wrong. So say I'm part of a country today where my country did something, you know, in the past, direct, grossly uh, unjust. Um, all, all of the citizens living today in a country are ones um, in whose name the act was committed, are part of the collectivity. And thus, all of them have a standing because they are members of that collectivity, have a standing and even a certain responsibility, I think, to um, participate in that apology or maybe pay part of one's tax money or what have you for, for the reparations, um, just simply as a way of taking responsibility for what was done in our name. But that's the collective dimension. The individual dimension differs. That's going to differ greatly depending on whether the person was you know, a hero, a villain, and indifferent was alive then. Um, maybe what that person was an opponent of the injustices and so forth. And therefore, on the individual dimension, that person's culpability would be, you know, greatly reduced to zero, or they may be, you know, we should laud them as a hero for having opposed it. Um, and so we should also do that on, on an, in, you know, on an individual basis, you know, the, 
logic of honors, we give honors to what people according to what they've done and what they deserve. And um, so it seems to me that one can have both of those things. That on one hand, as members of a collective in whom a wrong was done, we can say we as a collective are now going to join and endorse our collective's entities of apology or reparations on one hand, but then on the other, treating everyone as an individual, we acknowledge properly those who opposed, those who were, you know, were indifferent or those who were were guilty. I think there, there's there are real world reference for these things. I mean, um, you know, for instance, German leaders apologize for what happened. Germany as a nation continues to keep the memory alive of the Holocaust and continue to pass it down among its children and calls all of its citizens to sort of remain contrite, to rem to remember, to, you know, has called its citizens to engage in pay paying reparations, right? And we, we don't see think it's wrong to ask, ask uh, Germans to do this. On the other hand, we, um, on the individual level, we try war criminals, you know, we um, give honors to those who opposed the injustices. If you go to Germany, there are streets named after um, people who gave their lives uh, standing up to the Nazis, Sophie Scholl and um, uh, uh, General Beck and, and so forth. Um, and But we also remember the many who were indifferent or who just kind of passively went along um, you know, as philosophers such as Karl Jaspers have helped us to remember. So it seems to be these differentiated judgments um, are possible, and we can point to real-world uh, reference for them. Some sorting and sifting. Yes. Very difficult. Now, I have one more question that I want to put in here uh, before I uh, encourage Mario to come back. Uh, uh, you speak of an historical injustice, true historical injustice, the sort of thing that we ought to be thinking about, uh, well, making reparations for, apologizing for, as, as a violation of natural law. But I don't know of any country today that in any official way recognizes the existence of natural law. Yeah. <laughs> so what would be a, a legitimate, reasonable, uh, compelling uh, foundation for reparations, atonement, apology, uh, if there's no appeal to be made to natural law. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think you make a good point that natural law as a philosophy um, is something that all too few of us seem to to recognize, right? Even among natural lawyer law philosophers, there are you know intense uh, nuclear quality disputes over what the best justification is and so forth. Um. But I would say two things. One is, if natural law is true, which I think we all on this conversation think that it is, it's something that we have, even if we don't acknowledge its existence in in, in theory or as a philosophy. It's something that every human being has. It's written on the heart. That is, uh, Apostle Paul said, I mean, J. Bujaskowski, the um, natural law philosopher in Texas, says, says that natural law is something that you can't not know. And so... At some level, everyone has the natural law. But second of all, um, we, we do see the natural law reflected and embodied in law, laws and constitutions in many ways. And if you look at international law, there's a universal declaration of human rights. There are norms against aggression. There are norms against war crimes in humanitarian law. And so uh, there's... I think there, there's this phrase, the common conscience of mankind. I think that was in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, even if we can argue until we're blue in the face about natural law, there are still lots of ways in which natural law is reflected in the architecture of our of our shared institutions. 
And uh, now this isn't to say that law perfectly tracks um, that. I'm sorry, this is not to say that positive law perfectly tracks natural law. I mean, in some ways it, you know, egregiously departs from it. Think about uh, abortion, for instance. Um, uh, I don't want to make a kind of easy equation, but nevertheless, there is a kind of a deep structured sense in which um, natural law is reflected in our um, institutions. Most every country in the world today has a constitution. Most every constitution has a bill of rights. Well, human rights are, you know, most of them are rooted in natural law and most of them have find a place in, you know, constitutions. Um, court systems are built around the basic intuition that um, do, committing a crime um, renders one guilty and liable to punishment. Um, so that basic instu kind of axiomatic intuition of uh, retribution is kind of structured into our norms and institutions. And so, um, you know, these things can be appealed to, even if we don't have the philosophical agreement. But the these things can be appealed to as shared norms. We can get a fair distance by doing that. And certainly on racism, very, you know, almost nobody today would argue that the racist actions or history were, were justified. I mean, most of the you know heavy disputes about uh, reparations today have to do with, is there still racism? You know, if you give this money to people, will it really have a good effect? Um, does it just deepen divisions, things like that? But nobody disputes the basic uh, norms of, of racism. And so I think we have uh, natural law substantially um, embedded in institutions in a way that can provide us with shared standards. Thank you. That that's helpful too, uh, Mario. It's it's very interesting. Um, you keep me uh, thinking about um, the situation in 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 different countries. Uh, just a couple of examples. Um, Spain they have enacted the law of historical memory. Mm -hmm. So the government somehow selected memory justify one side of the civil war. Mm -hmm. And so was completely politicized the how we understand um, history. The same thing you have in Argentina a week ago where the those who are in power, which are progressive, so to speak, even though they come in from the traditional Peronist movement, um, co-opted, if you will, the uh, May the twenty fifth, which is the Independence Day, and they gave completely an interpretation uh, from this tradition. So, and that come from precisely the idea of reparation, at least from the nineteen eighty five, which. Uh, they gave the um, uh, enhanced the theory of uh, rejecting the theory of the two demons. The, in other words, violation of human rights were done by the state. We agree on that, but also they deny were uh, were um, violated by the guerrilla movement, so that they look just one mm -hmm. side. Mm -hmm. So, and that still mm -hmm. have not healed the profound wound in that society. Yeah. So, and the question is, again, going back to what I said, I have a friend of mine in Spain who is a philosopher. He said, what we are doing now, we are just uh, erasing or deleting the common sense from which we can understand what human right is. So mm -hmm. everything seems to be politicized, particularly in this postmodern world. So my, my question is, how then we move uh, toward more let uh, quote unquote objective view of these uh, violations. Um, yes, no, it's an excellent it's an excellent point, and yes, there are, Argentina is a good example of how this dealing with the past through punishment, apologies, reparations can be very politicized. So one group wants to look at, um, you know, one set of uh, you know, human rights violations, another another set. Um, Oftentimes, there's denial towards one's own, and and uh, and so so some and, and I gave the example of Japan as well. Sometimes these measures, um, you know, increase divisions, um, and um, 
I think I think the problem there we shouldn't label the problem there though as one of um, re relativism. Um, even you know peoples who accept the standards of human rights, um, you know, are going to have d d d very different memories or very different accounts of things. Now there are divisions about whether human rights can be violated um, because of national emergencies. Um, I think during the the dirty war, those who defend the actions of the disappeared peoples and uh, so forth um, would say, normally you can't do this, but this was a national emergency that and, you know the, the the country was being threatened with civil war and so forth. And um, so, but but nevertheless, um, you know, I, th I think the problem though it has to do with selectivity, with politicization, with um, different sides having different accounts of what happened, but who is responsible and so forth. Um, and I can only say that, uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, there are, there are, th these are just pragmatic problems, problems with, with political divisions. Um, you know, uh, there may be cases where it's not wise to go forth with an apology or reparations just because on prudential grounds, it's not likely to, um, you know, gain a consensus. And, um, there are other countries, though, where it's been much more successful, um, Germany, Canada, Australia, where there is a wide popular consensus that, yes, those things were wrong. Yes, we should make good on it and uh, we should continue to do so. So, um, you know, I think it's hard, it's hard to give any real solid theoretical answer to this problem. I don't think it really calls into question the moral case, but it does suggest that, you know, there's a strong political case there, you know, to try to build consensus, to try to, um, you know, take those kinds of actions that can uh, build consensus. I think one of those is for different sides to acknowledge the the wrongs of their own side. Um, but we do see this sometimes. Like South Africa after apartheid, there was a you know compared to other countries a remark a remarkably wide example of. Uh, officials who had been apartheid officials who later came to apologize and they did so in a context um, where reconciliation and forgiveness was be being emphasized. Now there are still divisions. There's so many in South Africa who say it was inadequate, it was unfair, it was skewed and so forth and so on. Um, so these things will, you know, in this, in this world, in this side of the, the veil, it's always going to be partially achieved. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of, uh, prudence and a lot of, uh, you know, the art of politics that's going to be involved, which um, is going to determine whether and how uh, reparations and apologies ought to be uh, pursued. Let me the, keep... uh, go ahead, Mario. No, it, it just one uh, quick question. Uh, we talk about forgiveness. Um, does forgiveness include necessarily reparation? Or like, uh, I just forgive my friend that he owe me such and such thing. And I say, I forgive yeah. you. Forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a really good question. You know, forgiveness is re one of the remarkable things about global politics in the past um, generation is the emergence of forgiveness. And it's talked about and and practiced and, and has been in a number of different countries, usually by individual uh, victims. And um, so what does it mean and what does it mean for other practices? But one thing that I would argue is that forgiveness does not mean that we relinquish other just practices, such as just punishment, acknowledgement, reparations, apology, other forms of repair, memory that need to take place. So forgiving doesn't mean we should relinquish those other measures of justice. And I think that, you know, people who have forgiven usually don't um, re relinquish them or say that they're wrong. What is forgiveness then? Um, well, I look closely at the text of uh, Jesus' commandment to forgive. He said, forgive them their debts. Mm -hmm. And so what? So he, that that presupposes that there's a debt that sin leaves a kind of a debt, and here what I think is happening is the the concept of debt is an economic metaphor that is used for moral wrong and for a kind of moral status that 
um, uh, wrong wrongdoing leaves. And that term debt for sin actually came through Aramaic. It came into the Bible around the 5th century BC and was prevalent in the Second Temple time. And so therefore Jesus um, uses the language. Um, so what does it mean to say that there's a moral debt for sin? Well, and then, and then Jesus is saying, forgo that moral debt. Well, what is a moral debt for sin? Well, if somebody wrongs you, you, there is a kind of moral debt and probably some kind of you know, some just retribution. I mean, you might decide not to talk to somebody. You might decide not to show up at the person's parties. You might de decide not to speak well of the person. You might, you know, there is a kind of, um, uh, you know, just kind of retributive actions that we take proportionate and, and so forth for for wrongs. And Jesus is saying to forego those. Um, and, and also I think forgiveness involves a will towards the restoration of the perpetrator. Um, and so I look at people who have forgiven in the situations of armed conflict. And so you have to ask, well, what does that mean then that they're forgoing the moral debt? And, and then and what does it mean that it does not involve forgoing just punishment and so forth? It's hard to answer exactly, but think about, um, I think about when John Paul II uh, went to visit his assassin in prison and forgave him. Now, John Paul II, as far as I know, had never called for the person's forg uh, prison sentence to be commu uh, commuted. He didn't say this person should be let free from prison, but yet he went in and he forgave him. So what did that mean that he was forgiving him, even while he wasn't? you know, trying to release, break him out of prison. Well, there must be some sense in which John Paul was for, forgiving a kind of a moral debt. Um, look, he was, he was choosing to look upon that person in a different way, not as somebody who owes me something, even though you tried to take my life, you tried to kill me. But I'm now, um, I'm now deciding to will your good. I don't look at you as somebody who I'm asking for um, you know, retributive action that I perform against you or that you owe me, but rather I want to say I wish you your good. I hope that you would repent for this. I hope that you would, um, you know, undergo a kind of moral improvement. That you say I, I, I hope that you renounce this and then become somebody who doesn't do these things, who, um, you know, comes to be redeemed and be restored. Um, so it's a kind of a change, maybe it's a change in the way that one looks upon that, that, that perpetrator. Um, you know, maybe it's best, uh, illustrated through these, these kinds of examples. We are always to love our enemies. It's not that we don't have enemies, but we are always to love them, which is to say we are always to seek their good to affirm that their good is in fact something that we ought to advance and in certain contexts perhaps to to forgive someone is to say once again yes though you have treated me wrongly and in a sense you are my enemy i nonetheless forgive you and pro publicly pro proclaim that that uh, i recognize my duties to love you Perhaps it could be directed, forgiveness directed towards a reaffirmation of love, perhaps. Now, I think that the core idea of your position uh, is absolutely right. And not only is it absolutely right, but you're... you're ready to acknowledge the tendencies towards politicization and distortion and so forth. Uh, and to some extent, I, I feel like I, I'm losing track of, of your major point and your major argument and its rightness by bringing in related questions. But in order to effectuate uh, the reforms and the reform of the spirit that, that you are advocating, uh, 
we do need to address these secondary considerations. Mm -hmm. And here's, here's one secondary consideration. Very oftentimes, uh, a, a group uh, is charged with cultural imperialism. And uh, there's an effort to, to uh, address that problem of cultural imperialism. Uh, and yet, in some cases, uh, I don't really think there is at root a cultural imperialism. Here's one example. In California, for at least, oh, at least 30 or 40 years, there's been an effort to teach Ebonics in the public schools. And the idea is, uh, speaking very, very, very broadly, uh, you want these kids to read the, the plays of Shakespeare? Why, that's, that's cultural imperialism. Instead, they should read uh, black authors and uh, uh, develop a, a greater facility for speaking black English, and they should do so without any apology whatsoever. They should feel free to do so, and they should receive at least equal funding through the public education to develop the, the linguistic cultures uh, connected with Ebonics and the like. Now, my first reaction would be, uh, no, that's not cultural imperialism, or it certainly need not be cultural imperialism. Uh, this is uh, fundamentally an English-speaking country. It might not remain so, and it need not remain so, but it is that now. And when we teach the English classics, it's not a matter of cultural imperialism. Mm -hmm. And then I'd be inclined to go ahead further and say to uh, liberationist groups, speaking very, very broadly, who say that we, we ought to rethink Catholic theology and use the categories of, of different cultures altogether. And what I'd want to say is, well, some cultures might not be able to supply the conceptual grounds for Catholic theology that, say, classical Greek philosophy has, in fact, supplied. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, it, it, in one sense, these sorts of questions are removed from what you're speaking of. And yet, in another sense, you want to say that we have to look at case number one, and then look at case number 21, and then look at case number 121, and avoid trivialization and politicization. And, and uh, on the trivial side, just, just another example, it's often charged that it's uh, uh, cultural, culturally insensitive for an Anglo to have dreadlocks. And yet, we're oftentimes told that we ought to look to uh, other cultures and draw on on their contributions wherever it is. And if, if somebody were to say in the United States, uh, we're a sorry because they really thought they were a lot better than some of the uh, uh, products that are now being purveyed. Uh, well, I think you see where I'm headed. Any yeah. comments here? Yeah. Well, I have to say, um, one of the reasons I articulated this um, Christian view of reparations, and um, there's kind of a subtext here, although I, I don't kind of wear it on my sleeve, but um, it, it is an effort to differentiate what I think is the strongest case for reparations from some of the, frankly, strongest voices advocating for reparations and um, against racism today. And um, really the criterion what we, by which we can distinguish, you know, cultural imperialism from genuine forms of justice is, is truth. And, and then it comes back to natural law and certain te teachings of Jesus, which I think built upon the natural law. Um, and what I want to do is um, root 
this case in the kind of civilizational heritage and American heritage of the valid affirmations of truth that I think represent cultural achievements. And in America is a mixed bag. There's great injust injustices. Look at our constitution. Um, at that time, it basically, um, it would fail to outlaw slavery, but in the constitution and the declaration, we also have basic human rights. We have the great achievement of religious freedom. We've got, um, you know, the dignity of the person created in the image of God. Um, and those are extremely um, important. And in our history, Lincoln and Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King and even Barack Obama all appeal back to that heritage of truth that um, we have as part of our national history. And from that basis, opposing racism, arguing for reparations and so forth. Unfortunately, a lot of the kind of contemporary um, opponents of racism seems to have abandoned this heritage. They're speaking more out of the kind of um, intellectual currents of the that are dominant in the academy in the last so you know many uh, decades. Foucault, and it's all about power. It's all about deconstruction. It's all about um, overthrowing the heritage, overthrowing the institutions. But really, from from a point of nowhere. For, but without any real moral basis, basis. all just power against power. And um, I think that's very destructive because it doesn't give us any any basis for um, these principles, but it also extremely divisive. It threatens to tear the Republic apart. So you look at like the 1619 Project, which wants to kind of deconstruct the founding and say, we shouldn't go back to 1776. Um well, that's the whole platform. I mean, look at Martin Luther King. It wasn't you know, coincidence that he stood up in front of the Lincoln Memorial when he gave his I Have a Dream speech. He looked back to the founding and he said, there's a, you know, a promissory note that hasn't been cashed yet. He's appealing to our history. He appealed back to Lincoln. Lincoln appealed back to the Declaration. And so we have shared truth. And that's the promising basis on which to build consensus. And I think that's what reparations and apologies are really about is repairing the fabric, um, you know, consonantly with our tradition and our history, the human rights magisterium, as you can, as you might put it. Um, so I'm also very uh, concerned with some of the um, kind of underlying currents, even if I agree with some of the proposals made by some of the, uh, you know, most prominent articulators of, uh, you know, opposition to racism and so forth. I'm very skeptical of of the, the basis and the um you know way in which they go about it. So the uh Spartacist League or uh, the Red Guard, they they don't in any way undercut the truths of the Hebrew prophets. Correct. Those truths are 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 remaining and um there's plenty of basis there for a prophetic uh, denunciation of injustices, but it only makes sense if it's rooted in truth. Thank you. Mario. Let's change a little bit about um, um, this aspect and move into wealth inequality. Um, as you write that it's entirely plausible to attribute vast inequality in wealth, position, opportunity faced by African Americans today to historical injustices faced within the past two generations. What do you mean by that? Yeah, well, I was reading a blog post yesterday by some um, skeptics of reparations, and they were saying, well, take a, a struggling town in Ohio. Why is it right to give reparations to African Americans, but not to the white working class, which is also you know, struggling with opioids and the decline of industry and so forth and so on. But the thing is, is that the problem is not merely an economic one. It's not that African Americans are are poor or what have you. The problem is, is that it's the re result of a wrong, a colossal crime, and that that actively and explicitly discriminated between African Americans and whites. And, and, and it's that crime of racism, of the discrimination, that is the wrong. Right. So, yeah, pover poverty is bad. Yes, opioid addictions are bad. Yes, um, 
the plight of the working class is bad. Yes, we should do something about it. Yes, we should care about it. But with the racism, there's something um, additional. There's the historical injustice of of the discrimination uh, um, di directed against this group of people. That's the real thing that demands reparations. Re reparations are different from, say, uh, um, you know, an anti-poverty program. Just as, you know, a bunch of people who are wounded from a massacre differs from people whose town was destroyed by a tornado. You know, there's a moral wrong in the first place, whereas uh, the second is, you know, result of a natural disaster. Yes, we should help them, but there's something morally different where there was a wrong committed. One of the eye-opening things for me was um, looking at the economic discrimination in the 1930s and 1940s due to the New Deal and the Fair Deal. An enormous amount of money was transferred to um, people through the Social Security and the GI Bill and, and so forth. And yet African-Americans were actively and explicitly um, denied or vastly disproportionately denied these funds. And so um, Ira Katznelson calls it when affirmative action was white. So people who are against affirmative action ought to think about the fact that vast affirmative action was practiced, but it was practiced on behalf of whites. And so this did much, in, along with redlining and so forth, to create the vast um, economic disparities we have today. But the problem is not just the economic disparities, it's the, it, it's the wrong. Let me uh, introduce uh, another theme here. We are all of us uh, members of the American Solidarity Party. Yes. And yeah. that party is really based uh, on Catholic social thought. Mm -hmm. And a yes. key element of Catholic social thought is the principle of subsidiarity. Yes. And Jacques Maritain, once upon a time, and we should keep him in mind always, said that one of the great difficulties in world government is that people really hadn't uh, <clears throat> taken into account fully their own national uh, contributions and hadn't really taken into account uh, the connections that need to be made between the national and the international. Now, how about connections between the state, as in, say, the state of Illinois, the state of California, and the United States? Or how about the connections between specific municipalities in the state and uh, going up? Uh, and, and what I'm suggesting is that in order for reconciliation and apology and reparations not to be hollow moves, not to be uh, cosmetic moves, there has to be a real deep support for them. And that support might best begin at the local level. Mm -hmm. I want to take two particular cases. In Evanston, Illinois, demonstrably uh, African Americans were redlined uh, out of uh, parts of the town, significant parts of the town, in such a way that they simply could not buy homes. It just couldn't be done. I mean, maybe there'd be some outlier or other who would manage to buy a home. But the great majority of, of, of Blacks simply could not buy in major areas of Evanston. Mm -hmm. And this was a matter of historical record, and mm -hmm. it was acknowledged as such. Nobody denied it. It happened. It was clearly the case that it happened. And the city of Evanston moved to make reparations on that basis. And they were able to draw on particular uh, sets of data and mm -hmm. make uh, reparations that were significant and, and correlated. All right, that's Illinois. Here in SoCal, Southern California, there has just been affected a significant reparation. There was in one of our fabled beach communities, in which communities there's not left a single square inch anybody to enjoy the beach or the sun or anything else, there was a, a, a black resort. It was 
owned by black people. It, it especially welcomed black people. And one of the beach communities simply legally under the, the guise of law forced them out, forced them out, resold the land to a, a group of white investors. This happened. Nobody denies that it happened. Now, reparations have been made. The land has been returned. I think a case for reparation might, might very well, and I, I'm sure you would agree with this, uh, benefit at a national level if actions that were, were focused on local levels were promoted again and again as, as exemplars of what this might mean, concrete examples of what this might mean. Thoughts on that? Yeah, no, I think these are, are really interesting. And um, so when we talk about collective injustices, justices committed in the name of a collective, there are different collectives that um, have done them. There are state governments, local governments, and the federal government. And I think there's something very valuable about looking back at um, the injustices that that particular government um, committed in a relatively kind of concentrated agentic sort of way. That's a fancy way of saying that it was mainly that institution who did it, right? Um, and so if a city passed ordinances or practiced redlining or something, then there's something to be said about that city uh, do, doing the reparations. And so, yes, I think there's a lot of um, lot to be said for uh, subsidiary subsidiarity there. And other organizations, I think um, Georgetown's, Georgetown University had a wonderful um, uh, set of processes just a few years ago. I think they really did it right. They look back at the history of uh, owning slaves and selling slaves in its in its own history, and um, had a, had public events, had um, substantial reparations paid in the forms of scholarships and uh, and so forth, and really sought to uh, build a consensus. And um, you know, I think it was done in a really good way and at the level of that university. And so. There's a kind of, um, you know, matching logic here by which the institutions who did it most intentionally, um, uh, you know, then perform the reparations. The one thing I would say, though, is that I still think there is a strong case for the federal government to take a, a central role. First of all, the amount of reparations that really are uh, would be justified are the ones that are the uh, is the amount that the only the federal government would be capable of paying. I also think there there is some sense in which the federal government, you know, the um the constitution ultimately is a is a federal document. It's for for us all. Um there is some sense in which the federal government is always responsible, even if you know invidious laws of discrimination take place at, at the level of the state. I mean ultimately it's the there's a responsibility of the federal government to, to uh, to do something about it. I mean, ultimately, in the you know the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 1960s, we had the federal government going down and enforcing um, again against discrimination, and um, you know we had the Congress passing the um, you know <clears throat> Equality Acts 1964, uh, Civil Rights Acts in 1964, 1965. Um, and so even though the discrimination may have been happening at the level of states, the, it was the federal government that has a certain responsibility of saying, you know, no, no, you can't do that. So I basically am sympathetic with the uh, matching um, idea, doing it at the level at which it was committed, but also remembering that there's still a responsibility that primarily and only the federal government has. Both and. Both and, Yes. Mario, we have time for one last question. We do. Um, so um, what do you think about the concept of covenant? Mm. Will that concept mean something in this um, secularized yes. world that we live in? Yes. Well, that's very interesting because... Um, Here's where I think the Christian resources, um, which were appealed to by Lincoln and Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King, have a great deal to offer in terms of, um, you know, confronting the original sin, 
So, you know, if you take the analogy of original sin a little bit further, yes, there's original sin, but Christianity doesn't end there. I mean, God has a response to original sin, you know, in the cross and resurrection, and that's not the end of the story. Um, there's, there, there's redemption. And there was a great volume edited a couple years ago on race and covenant by a group of Christians talking about the notion of a national covenant um, with respect to race and, and reconciliation. And, um, you know, thinkers such as Frederick Douglass saw the nation as a collectivity that could commit wrongs as a collectivity, could suffer the consequences of those wrongs as a collectivity, but also could ma make acts of atonement and acts of reparation and seek forgiveness as a, as a community. And I think Lincoln spoke this way in the second inaugural when he portrayed the Civil War as a kind of a, a punishment or a kind of consequence of, of slavery that the nation as a whole was, was facing. And again, he used very theologically rich concepts and um, now to talk about covenant, again, one must keep in mind everything I said about the differences between collective and individual, and it doesn't erode or uh, individual responsibility or wrongly uh, um, uh, assign individual responsibility, doesn't erode people's freedom to act or not act on it. But to, to the, the covenant recognizes that we as a nation, as a collectivity, um, engage in moral responsibility and, and acts of repair. And for most of the history of Western countries, including the United States, but also European countries um, during their Christian history, it was very common to talk about countries as having a kind of um, moral status. Countries could sin. Countries could, you know, apologize. Countries could suffer for their sins. Countries could seek repair and forgiveness and restoration, just as ancient Israel could. But as you mentioned, we live in a secularized time. And in, in the United States, this kind of talk has gradually um, departed from the mainstream of our civic conversation, particularly after the Vietnam War. It is mostly, you know, uh, voices from the religious right it's in a rather dubious fashion, I think, who speak this way, God punishing us for homo homosexuality and so forth. Um, but it used to be much more of a consensual, widely shared thing that was also in, in, in that was often invoked with respect to racism. And um, you know whether this could be um, resurrected, I'm not sure. I think I think you know Christians should could still continue to advocate it, and maybe. Maybe it's something that others could appreciate in a more secularized form. Really, just the idea that we as a collective have a responsibility and we as a collective might seek to repair the fabric. But it, it really is a deeply Christian idea. Thank you. Thank you so much. We're going to, as we always do, finish with the gospel for the day. And this is the Feast of the Visitation. Mary set out and traveled to the hill country in haste to a town of Judah, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the infant leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth, filled with the Holy Spirit, cried out in a loud voice and said, Most blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And how does this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For at the moment the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the infant in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed are you who believed that what was spoken to you by the Lord would be fulfilled. And Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy 
the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this great opportunity. And I love this podcast. I love your love your show and uh would love to continue to, to follow it and uh greatly admire all that all that you guys do. And we 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 Thank really you. appreciate all your pro bono efforts. <laughs> I'm not being Thank paid you. for this. Wait a second. <laughs> all right. Godspeed. The, okay. The check the check is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> As always. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.